One of America's leading political scientists, Professor John Mishana, is a distinguished service professor of political science at the University of Chicago. He graduated from the West Point Military Academy in 1970 and served five years as a US Air Force officer before pursuing his postgraduate studies. More recently, Professor Mishama generated international attention for his argument that the US and its allies were culpable for the conflict in Ukraine. He sat down with us to examine some of the most pressing geopolitical events of our time. John, you said during your presentation today, and I quote, the mess we are in cannot be underestimated. And you mentioned that that is because of the global balance of power shifting from unipolarity to multipolarity. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Well, during the unipolar moment, which ran from about 1990 yeah. up to 2017, there was only one great power in the system by definition. It was unipolar, and that was the United States. And in a unipolar world, you cannot have great power competition by definition. So it was a remarkably peaceful world in terms of great power war. Then what happened starting around 2017 is we went from a unipolar world to a multipolar world where there are three great powers on the planet, one being the United States, two being China, and three being Russia. So great power competition was back on the table, right? And what happened was that the United States and China, starting in about 2017, began to engage in an intense security competition. And of course, in Europe, the United States and Russia became deeply involved in a conflict over Ukraine. So we now live in a world where there are two great power competitions that threaten to escalate to war. The US-China competition in East Asia and the US-Russia competition in Eastern Europe. Mm. That's a fundamentally different situation than the one that existed during the unipolar moment when there was no great power competition. And it's even fundamentally different than the world that existed when I was young during the Cold War, yeah. where we lived in a bipolar world, where there were two great powers on the system, in the system, and you had one security competition involving the United States and the Soviet Union. Just think about it. We had one security competition, the United States and the Soviet Union, yeah. then we went to unipolarity and had none, and now we're in multipolarity and we have two great power security competitions. So this is a more dangerous world even than the Cold War. And John, so the US becoming a regional hegemonic power is why China could not rise peacefully, would you say? You mentioned US being Godzilla. No, my argument is that the ideal situation for any great power is to be a regional hegemon, mm. to completely dominate your region of the world. And the United States, starting in about 1900, became a regional hegemon in the Western Hemisphere. The United States, however, does not want any other country to become a regional hegemon. It wants to be the only regional hegemon in the system. Mm -hmm. So I argue that in the 20th century, the United States went to great lengths to prevent Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union from becoming regional hegemons. We helped prevent those countries from achieving that exalted position in the system. Mm. And what's happening now is that China, because it's become economically powerful and therefore militarily powerful, is thinking about trying to establish regional hegemony in Asia. Now, from China's point of view, that makes absolutely good sense. If I were in Beijing running Chinese foreign policy, I'd want China to be a regional hegemon, just like the United States is a regional hegemon in the Western Hemisphere. But the problem is the United States does not tolerate other regional hegemons. And the United States will go to great lengths to prevent China from dominating Asia, the same way it prevented Germany, Japan, and the Soviet Union mm. from becoming regional hegemons in the 20th century. Would you say that's being reflected in what's happening in Ukraine and Russia, with Russia wanting to exert their power? No, I think that's the conventional <laughs> wisdom in the West, mm. that Russia is 
determined to become a regional hegemon. Mm. It's determined to imitate the Soviet Union, that Russia wants to conquer Ukraine, conquer other countries in Eastern Europe, and dominate Europe the way we worried about the Soviet Union dominating Europe during the Cold War. But this is a myth. This is simply not true. What the Russians are doing in Ukraine is they're reacting to the fact that the United States and its European allies are pushing NATO up to Russia's border, and they're trying to include Ukraine in NATO. From Russia's point of view, this is an existential threat. The United States and its allies are crossing a red line. The Russians say, under no circumstances can Ukraine become a member of NATO. I mean, they went to war to prevent that, mm. right? So it's a very different logic that's at play in Europe than is at play in East Asia, where actually you see China in a position where it can countenance becoming a regional hegemon. Russia is not in that position. Hmm. So then what's the end game? I think the end game is continued conflict for the foreseeable future. Uh, I don't think that uh, there's any meaningful solution, any meaningful peace agreement uh, that uh, the United States and its allies and Ukraine on one side mm -hmm. and Russia on the other side uh, can reach. Uh, I think the best that we can hope for is a frozen conflict where at some point you get a ceasefire, but not a meaningful peace agreement. You mentioned during your talk about Ukraine having to become a neutral state in order for yes. peace to, to exist. But um, how do we get there? Possibly? We don't. No, my view mm. on why you can't get a meaningful peace agreement is that you can't get a settlement on territory. Right? Okay. Russia has conquered and annexed a large swath of territory in, in Ukraine, and the Russians are not going to give that back. So that's the first giant obstacle to a peace agreement. The second giant obstacle is the one that you're talking about, which is the neutrality issue. Mm. The Russians say that the only way we can have a meaningful peace agreement is if we have a neutral Ukraine, a Ukraine that is not allied militarily with NATO in any way. It's neutral. The Ukrainians, of course, and the West, and this includes the United States mainly, say that's unacceptable. We have to have some sort of security arrangement with Ukraine. And you can understand why the Ukrainians want a security guarantee from the West. Mm -hmm. But from the Russian perspective, that is categorically unacceptable. So how do you square that circle? You know, how, mm. how do you create a neutral Ukraine at the same time yes. you have a Ukraine that has a security relationship with the West? And the answer is you don't. And so it's for those two reasons, the mm. neutrality issue and the territory issue, that you can't m reach some sort of meaningful peace agreement. And that's why the best you can hope for is a frozen conflict. But a frozen conflict will have, you know, truly negative consequences for relations between Russia and the West mm. and Russia and Ukraine. You said historically wars have been won by wars of population strength and wars of attrition. So China and the US war, it's a very different story. Could you explain more about how th there's been a shift in, in that as well? Well, I think that if you look at the Ukraine war, uh, what you see is an old-fashioned war of attrition mm -hmm. where the Russians on one side and the Ukrainians on the other side are standing toe-to-toe -to -toe and pounding each other. Uh, one could argue that what they're trying to do is bleed each other white, and the question is which side will quit first. And in a war like that, uh, what really matters is population size, mm -hmm because the number of soldiers you will have in each army is a function of the size of the population uh, most of the time. And then what also matters is the balance of artillery, right? Because artillery is the principal weapon in a war of attrition. And the great advantage that the Russians have is they have a five to one advantage in population and they have somewhere between a five to one and 10 to one advantage in artillery.
So in a very important way, the Ukrainians are doomed in this conflict. A war involving the United States and China in East Asia would be of a fundamentally different nature mm. because it would not be a land war. It would not be a war fought on the Asian continent between big armies, mm. similar to what you see in Ukraine. It would be a war over Taiwan, a war over the South China Sea, a war over the East China Sea. Naval assets and air assets would be much more important than the ground armies on both sides. Mm. Uh, so I don't think there's a close parallel between the two conflicts. But where I do see an important parallel and a disturbing parallel is that I think that if a war broke out between the United States and China, mm. it would be, number one, very hard to shut down, just like the Ukraine-Russia war is very hard to shut down. And I think the best you could hope for in a U.S.-China scenario where you had a war is a frozen conflict. In other words, you wouldn't get a genuine peace agreement, you'd get a frozen conflict. And the great danger there would be the same danger you get with a frozen conflict in Ukraine, mm -hmm. which is that it might start up again uh, because you would still have poisonous relations between the rival sides mm -hmm. and the possibility of that cold conflict turning into a hot conflict would be ever present. Mm. I'm going to switch focus a little bit. How should we view the expansion of BRICS to include other countries? Well, I actually think in the final analysis that it will not be to BRICS advantage to bring in more and more countries mm. because it will then become unwieldy. Uh, there are lots of Europeans, West Europeans, uh, who make the argument that it was a mistake to expand the European Union into Eastern Europe and bring in all of these countries because it makes it a more unwieldy institution. It makes it harder to get agreement on important policies. So a lot of people in Western Europe view Viktor Orban and Hungary as a real problem because Orban oftentimes doesn't agree with uh, the policy prescriptions that the majority of the members favor. So anytime you expand a, an institution like BRICS, uh, it becomes more unwieldy and I think ultimately less effective. Uh, and of course, you also want to remember that inside of BRICS, mm. uh, you have uh, problems between some of the members that are uh, significant. And the best example here, of course, is China and India, who have a serious mm. dispute over mm. what the border looks like between those two countries. Does it also change the equation between the US and China? I don't think so. No. No, I, I don't think BRICS matters much for changing uh, the relationship between the United States and China. What's driving the change that has taken place in the U.S.-China relationship uh, over the past uh, six or seven years is the growth of China. As China gets economically more and more powerful, that is going to scare the United States and it's going to scare China's neighbors, you know, to include countries like Vietnam, the Philippines, Japan, Korea. Uh, because it's just so powerful. And it, you know, these countries all live next door yes. to China. The United States is very powerful, but the United States is many thousands of miles away. And in a very important way, it's less of a threat to these countries than China is. Um, it's like if you come into the Western Hemisphere, most countries in the Western Hemisphere do not like the United States at all. They think the United States is a bully and having the United States as a neighbor is a real problem. Mm -hmm. They can't do anything about it because the United States is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And I think you see an analogous situation here uh, in Asia. I think that uh, China has grown more and more powerful. Uh, the Chinese are, like the Americans, ruthless in their foreign policy. They do what they think is in their national interest. Uh, it's not like they're interested in harming other countries on purpose, but China will do what's in its national interest. Mm. And this will 
sometimes be harmful to other countries. The Americans act the same way. So as China gets more powerful, everybody gets very nervous. And there are limits to what the Chinese can do to prevent that. Uh, so as they grow more powerful, uh, mm. the relationship between China and most of its neighbors and China and the United States will, in my opinion, invariably become more competitive. And you were saying that on a sovereign level and in an economic level as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, if, if you think about the competition between the United States and China, I, I refer to it as a security competition. But that security competition has an economic dimension yes. and the military dimension. The military dimension is obvious. But the economic dimension revolves mainly around cutting edge technologies like semiconductors, artificial intelligence, and so forth and so on. And what the Americans really worry about is that if China becomes the number one country in the world in terms of developing these sophisticated technologies, its economy will grow more quickly or faster than the American economy, which would be disastrous, not only economically, but militarily, because mm. military power is based on economic might, right? So the United States is very worried that, the, that, that China is going to be the leading country in the world in terms of developing cutting edge technologies, yes. and that will cause its economy to uh, outdistance the American economy. But also, these sophisticated technologies have military applications, yes. right? And if the Chinese develop these really sophisticated technologies in ways that are better than the way the Americans develop, that will affect uh, the military hardware that the two sides have. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see this real intense economic competition involving high-end technologies. At the same time, you're going to see an intense military competition. And I more broadly define that as the security competition. Mm. It's really, it's, it's always hard to predict the future. What are your views on what we can see next? I suppose you couldn't have imagined an economic war that we see today. Well, I would actually argue that I did foresee present competition, mm -hmm. both economic and military, between the United States and China. Uh, I, I believe starting in the early 2000s, or I started arguing publicly starting in 2001, that as China grew more powerful economically, that there would be an intense security competition involving both uh, economics and military uh, matters. Uh, and, uh, and so I think I was right in that regard. And I think you'll see more of the same moving forward. I mean, what really matters in an economic competition in this day and age is who is developing cutting edge technologies. Uh, you know, if you go back into the 19th century, the British started uh, as the cutting edge industrial power developing textiles, yeah. right, and iron. But then as we moved into steel, machine tools, and chemicals, mm. the British fell behind. And the Germans were much more of a cutting edge country. They had much more of a cutting edge economy when it came to developing steel, machine tools, chemicals, uh, and so forth and so on. And they, I believe, were therefore more powerful than Britain because Britain didn't keep up with the Germans. Yes. Uh, so I think with regard to the Chinese, you know, the Chinese, we, when I was young, even though China had a huge population, we did not consider China a great power. Remember, in the Cold War, it was the United States and the Soviet Union. It was a bipolar world. Why wasn't it a tripolar world or a multipolar world with China as the third great power? China certainly had the population size. What it didn't have was the wealth. It didn't have the economy right, that could support a truly powerful military, which would make it a great power. Yes. What's happened over time is that as a result of China's tremendous success at the economic level is that it's turned into a great power. Mm -hmm. In fact, I identify it and many other people identify it as a peer competitor of the United States. So it's that economic growth on the part of the Chinese that really matters for them. And the question moving forward is 
what does the economic competition between the United States and China, especially with regard to high-end technologies, look like? And if the Chinese beat the Americans in that race, uh, they'll end up, in my opinion, being more powerful than the Americans. And the Americans, as you know, recognize this, which is why the Americans are trying to slow down Chinese economic growth and speed up American economic growth. Do you have any predictions on who might win the next US elections? I don't. I don't even know who will run. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at Joe Biden, it seems that he's deeply committed to running and that the Democratic Party establishment wants him to run. At least that's the public story. Mm -hmm. But uh, it seems clear that he's too old for the job and that most Americans understand that. Even people who are sympathetic to his politics and think he's done a good job believe that he just doesn't have the mental faculties mm. to be president, uh, uh, you know, after 2024. Uh, so it could be that he steps down. And with regard to Donald Trump, it's very hard to tell what's going to happen to him. Uh, you know, he's been indicted a number of times. He may be in jail. Uh, and one could argue it's hard to see him uh, you know, running for president and winning. Uh, so it may be that in 2024 that it's not Biden and it's not Trump running against each other, or it may be not Biden but Trump, but who knows? And then if you ask the question, if it's not Trump or it's not Biden, who will it be? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, it's just very hard to say. Hmm. And uh, so American politics is in a, uh, it's in a very funny place. I, I never imagined that we'd be in a place like this. And of course, on top of all of this, you have these poisonous red-blue relations, right? Republicans and Democrats loathe each other, hate each other hmm. in ways that was never the case uh, when I was younger. And uh, you don't see any evidence or any sign that that's going to change for the better. Mm. So we have these two political parties who look like they're ready for a civil war, and we have no idea who's going to be the candidate. Well, it's funny you should say that. I heard during the forum that the chances of China invading Taiwan is smaller than the chance of US <laughs> having a civil war. <laughs> Would you agree? I don't know uh, how to think about that. I think the likelihood that China will invade Taiwan is very low. Uh, I think that militarily, it's an extremely difficult operation. And I, I don't foresee uh, China trying to invade Taiwan unless the Taiwanese are foolish enough to declare independence. I think if Taiwan were to declare its independence, the Chinese would invade, uh, even if they thought it was an extremely risky strategy. But I don't think that's likely. A civil war in the United States, it's hard to imagine. Mm. Uh, I mean, the, the last time we had a civil war was uh, 1865. That was a long time ago. And, uh, but you never know. I mean, there's no question that relations are poisonous enough mm. between the Democrats and the Republicans are between the Reds and the Blues that, you know, you could have, um, could have a civil war. I wouldn't be surprised if you had significant violence. Mm. Uh, and we've had that yes. many times before. When mm. I was younger in the 1960s, there was a great deal of violence in American cities and you could have that. Civil war, I, I'd, I'd be shocked if we had a civil war. Um, and. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if you had a war over Taiwan, but I'd be very surprised. Mm. I think that's, that's highly likely. So maybe what I'm saying in the end, I hadn't intended to say this, but maybe what I'm saying is I think a war over Taiwan is more likely than a civil war in the United States, but nevertheless, a war over Taiwan is unlikely. Mm. Okay. Let's talk about another part of the world, the Middle East. Saudi Arabia is opening up to the world as it embarks on its pursuit of Vision 2030. What does this opening up to the world mean and how does it impact the world order? Well, the Saudis uh, were very much a closed society and tried to isolate themselves from the rest of the world. I think they 
felt that they had a particular culture that was worth preserving and that if they opened up too much to the rest of the world, uh, that culture would be, be diluted and that that was a bad thing. Uh, but they've decided that the economic benefits of opening up uh, and the overall benefits for the population are so great that they're willing to uh, dilute the culture. Mm. Uh, I also think there's an economic dimension to this. I think they understand that they have become incredibly rich uh, with their oil resources. Uh, but as we move along, uh, oil may not be as important to the world economy as it is today, and therefore they will have to look for alternative ways of making money and living prosperously. You know, oil will not be enough. Maybe mm. it will be important, but by itself, not enough. Mm. So I think they're looking to develop a more dynamic economy. Mm. Uh, and that involves, in this day and age, as you well know, opening up to the world. So I think that that's what's happening. Uh, I think a final dimension to this is that the Saudis, for the longest time, had a very close relationship with the United States and depended on the United States for security. And uh, that allowed them to maintain a closed society. But I think the Saudis and the Americans have developed a very contentious relationship. Uh, it's not like the Americans still don't provide security for Saudi Arabia, but it's not as black and white as it used to be. Mm. So I think the Saudis in this multipolar world that we live in are flirting with the <laughs> Russians and especially with the Chinese to see if they can develop good relations with these other countries that will help facilitate their security in a situation where the United States is not seen as being as reliable as it once was. Mm. So I, this, the Saudis are you know, undergoing a fundamental change in, in all sorts of ways, not only in terms of how they deal with the world, but what their society itself looks like. The world knows you as a political scientist. How would you describe yourself as a person? Well, I view myself as a political scientist or more generally as a social scientist. And I believe that um, uh, that social science provides individuals with tools that help you think about the world in really smart ways, mm. right? That they provide theoretical tools and methodological tools that allow you to analyze uh, problems. Uh, so I view myself very much as a social scientist but I view myself also as an intellectual, maybe it's best to say a public intellectual, mm -hmm. in that I have a great deal of intellectual curiosity. I'm very interested about all sorts of issues besides international relations, besides the US-China or the US-Russia competition. Uh, and uh, I enjoy very much coming to events like this and talking to people because it provides me with an opportunity to learn all sorts of things that I don't know about subjects that I'm not an expert on. So I have a tremendous amount of intellectual curiosity that goes way beyond international politics. And in that sense, I view myself as a public intellectual or intellectual. Um, so I'm an intellectual and a social scientist. Has anyone surprised you with their questions or the topics that's being raised here at the forum? Uh, I think that I've heard the questions, almost all of the questions, in one form or another before. There are one or two questions that I probably hadn't thought about. I can't remember what they were. But uh, most of the time when I talk like I did this morning, mm. uh, the questions are familiar questions. And that's because you're dealing with smart people here and in other forums where I speak, mm. and smart people gravitate to the right questions, right? So when I do events like the one that I did today, I'm rarely surprised by the questions. Uh, sometimes they come in a slightly different form, mm. but uh, I'm pretty much aware of what's coming at me, and I'm prepared to answer those questions. But I'll tell you, I love questions that I've never, where I've never thought about 
what the answer is. And on one or two occasions over the past year or two, people have asked me a question that caught me off guard. I hadn't thought about the question, and I didn't have an answer. You know, sometimes people will ask you a question that you hadn't thought about, you had not heard before, but you can figure out what the answer is pretty quickly. But I've had questions where people ask me, I've had situations where people ask me a question and I don't have an answer. And what I usually do in those situations, I say, that's a great question and I'm not sure what to think about it, but what do you think about it? And I ask the questioner, to tell me what his or her answer is mm. uh, to the question that they asked. And then after I hear them, then I go back and forth. Uh, you know, I wrote a book a number of years ago called Why Leaders Lie. The way it happened is a man named Serge Schmemann, who wrote for the New York, who writes for the New York Times, called me up. I had never met him before. And he said, I was asked to write an article for the Times. Uh, on lying in international politics. And he said, for some reason, your name jumped into my head. And he said, uh, so I called you up and I just want to know what you think about lying in international politics. So I said to him, I was racing through my brain. I said, you know, I have no idea. I've never thought of the subject. Uh, so I said to him, why don't you just tell me, you do, you've been working on writing an article, tell me what you think, and then I'll bounce off your ideas. So he spent about five minutes sort of telling me what he was thinking about lying in international politics. And as he spoke, I developed all sorts of thoughts about the subject. Mm. So we talked for a good hour, maybe two hours, I can't remember, about lying in international politics. And at the end of the conversation, I wrote a memo for the record on the subject of lying in international politics, which I had never thought about until the phone conversation. And then I started giving talks on the subject <laughs> and I ended up writing a book. But isn't that interesting how I sort of came to that subject? It wasn't like I thought it was an important subject. I'd never even thought about it, which is kind of surprising because you know, deception is an important part of international politics and lying is an element in the deception equation. But I had not thought about it. But that conversation uh, resulted in a book. There you go. Thank you so much, John. It's my pleasure. Thank you for interviewing me.